Good morning. Thank you for tuning in and welcome. My name is Jennifer Schultz. I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications for OU Medicine. And today we're here to discuss the surge planning that OU Medicine has developed for taking care of COVID-19 patients. I'd like to start out by welcoming Chuck Spicer, President and CEO of OU Medicine. Good morning and thank you, Jennifer. We are in the midst of a pandemic that none of us have experienced before. But at OU Medicine, we, we believe we're uniquely positioned to respond to this crisis and the surge in patients we expect. Today, we are announcing our surge plan, which has been completed in coordination and collaboration across many partners, specifically and first our academic partner, OU Health Sciences Center, and coordinated across our health system partners in the city and the state, counting agencies, Governor Stitt's office and the Oklahoma Hospital Association. Our surge plan was developed in four phases, which will allow us to scale when additional needs arise. Also identifies beds across all OU Medicine facilities in, in Oklahoma City and in Edmond, as well as accelerating our bed tower projects that's, that's been under construction since 2017. I'd like to hand it over to Chris Gos, President of OU Medical Center, to talk about the first phases of our surge. Good morning. Thank you, Chuck. As Chuck said, physician and hospital leaders have been collaborating to update our surge plan for a viral pandemic plan, specifically COVID-19 in this case. The four phases of our surge plan make strategic use of space across several existing med OU medicine facilities, as well as space on three floors of the new patient tower. The spaces that we have identified will allow us to house patients 40% beyond our normal hospital capacity. In our existing facilities, we have identified space for additional beds in OU Medical Center, OU Medical Center Edmond, the Children's Hospital, and the Ambulatory Surgery Center on the Oklahoma City campus. In our existing facilities, the strategy involves converting several non-traditional spaces, such as operating rooms and post-anesthesia care units, to house critical care beds. In addition, the Children's Hospital will admit adult patients ages 18 up to 26, with some exceptions, as well as accepting pediatric patient transfers from other Oklahoma hospitals in order to open up capacity for critical care beds across the region and within OU Medical Center, and to provide the best care for the pediatric population during this difficult time. The public has been very supportive of the information articulated by public health experts, our public officials, and infectious disease experts. Please stay home if you can, and practice social distancing. Unfortunately, for the most ill of COVID-19 patients, treatment and care becomes an inpatient hospital stay. The way the virus works, it affects a patient's respiratory status. Intensive care beds become key in managing the treatment of a COVID-19 patient. The OU Medicine Surge Plan is focused on expanding this capability for Oklahomans who need it. At OU Medicine, we have an in-house CLIA certified lab, which is the highest quality of laboratory testing. Because of this capability, we are able to quickly achieve the most precise test currently available within one hour. This allows us to quickly determine if a patient with COVID-19 symptoms does in fact have the virus and to isolate them and begin our treatment protocols. It also allows patients who need other types of care to be quickly determined to be COVID-19 negative. This capability was also factored into our surge plan. At OU Medicine, we hope to not have to activate this plan today or in the future, but have planned diligently if our community needs it. I'll turn it back to Chuck. As a final part of our surge plan, we are grateful to announce today the acceleration of construction of three floors of our new patient tower, floors two, five, and six which was originally scheduled to open no in November, and now we are planning to open in early, the beginning of June. Floors five and six are the ICUs that will take care of those patients that require that level of care with the potential to double bed those patients to create capacity of up to 144 patients. Floor two will provide additional patient beds requiring acute care, but not as critically ill as ICU level patients. By opening these floors to the tower, OU Medicine will be adding up to 174 new beds to our capacity. The accelerated availability of this tower represents critical infrastructure for Oklahoma as we take on COVID-19 as a state. We believe that Oklahomans will greatly benefit from this as complex needs will arise. 
after the peak of COVID-19, we will need these new beds for the patients that had to postpone elective care because of the pandemic. And we'll also be able to prepare us in the event there's another surge later this year. Between the new patient tower floors and the spaces maximized across OE medicine facilities, we will now have a total of 421 ICU beds and 200 available, 285 available med surge beds at our peak capacity. We will still have beds reserved for patients not facing COVID-19, but are facing trauma, cancer, and other critical conditions. We felt it was critical to accelerate this project to activate all assets possible to fight this pandemic. We want to thank Congressman Tom Cole, Congresswoman Kendra Horn, Senator Zenhoff and Langford, Governor Stitt, other state officials for making sure this project received the support and attention we needed. We also want to thank Turner Construction to rise to this challenge and come up with a plan to do something incredible in 60 days. Now we have Congresswoman Kendra Horn and Congressman Tom Cole to talk about the federal support we've been given and, and uh, the support that they provided. And we'll start with uh, Congresswoman Kendra Horn. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chuck. I, I want to begin by extending, uh, extending my thanks to you uh, and all of OU Medicine, as well as uh, Chris, as the president of OU Medical Center, Dr. Jason Sanders, and the entire board of OU Medicine for the work that you are doing, for the initiative that you're taking uh, to provide care and expand uh, op options for those who need it across this state. Uh, and also to take a moment to thank all of the healthcare workers, those on the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, and everyone who is showing up uh, to combat uh, COVID-19 and save lives every day. OU Medicine uh, has truly been taking initiative uh, with today's surge plan and with, with many other areas to get more testing uh, where it is needed and to provide care as we face this unprecedented challenge. Uh, and, and the as we combat this spread of, of this pandemic, the additional beds, uh, ICU beds, as well as medical uh, and surgical beds uh, is going to be a critical capacity that will save lives and, and meet this need. Uh, today's announcement your, and the work that you've done could not have happened without your timely and aggressive action on the part of OU Medicine. And uh, as a member of Congress uh, and an Oklahoman, I am proud to, to who represents uh, OU Medicine, I'm proud to work with you and offer our, our support as we have passed these uh, legislation, these pieces of legislation to provide funding and support uh, and resources to combat the COVID-19 crisis. It requires uh, partners in our communities and our healthcare systems who are willing to take that additional step uh, and innovate and, and provide more assistance. Uh, I am proud to stand with and work with you and OU Medicine, uh, as well as uh, OU Health Sciences uh, and uh, Congressman Cole and our, the rest of our congressional delegation to pass historic funding and investment in our nation's healthcare system. And as a part of our COVID-19 response, including $100 billion for eligible healthcare providers, uh, such as OU Medicine. We know our work is not yet over and we must continue to look for areas where we can better support all of our healthcare workers and our system as a whole so that those combating COVID-19 as well as other uh, healthcare, uh, facing other healthcare challenges can get those needs met. So uh, I am incredibly uh, grateful for you and proud to partner with OU Medicine to support the health and well-being of Oklahomans before, during, and after this crisis. And I will continue to fight for the necessary resources to support OU Medicine and our healthcare providers across this state. Uh, I appreciate all that you're doing and look forward to continuing to combat COVID-19 and come out on the other side uh, stronger together. Thank you. Thank you for being our Congresswoman and Congresswoman Horn. We appreciate your valuable leadership you provide the state and the country at this challenging time. We now have a special video message from Congressman Cole, and we'll uh, move to that message now. Thank you. Hi, this is Congressman Tom Cole, the 4th District of Oklahoma. And I'm pleased that uh, technology allows me to join you this morning uh, and celebrate the announcement by OU Medicine of an effort to speed up the completion of two ICU uh, floors and the tower at the 
Oklahoma Medical uh, Health Care Center. This is an extraordinarily bold and important initiative by state leaders to try and make sure that Oklahoma is better prepared uh, for the COVID-19 crisis. It'll bring on new and much needed additional beds and uh, intensive care units uh, that will be available uh, should we experience uh, additional problems in Oklahoma in dealing with the coronavirus. Uh, I was extraordinarily pleased to support this project when I first heard about it and to pledge that I would do whatever I can uh, to make sure that there's appropriate federal support for this initiative going forward. We're already working on that. We'll continue to work with the leaders at OU Medicine in the days and weeks ahead as we try to make Oklahoma as prepared as it can possibly de be to deal with the pandemic uh, which now confronts us. Thank you, thank you, Congressman Cole. I'd now like to introduce a valued partner and incredible physician leader, Dr. John Zubiel, the Executive Dean of the OU College of Medicine. John. Thank you, Chuck. During this critical time in our community and state, the OU Health Sciences Center Colleges and our hospital system partner, OU Medicine, Inc., have come together in extraordinary ways to face this crisis as an academic center of excellence. What that means for our patients is the ability to bring together talent from across multiple health disciplines to find the best treatment strategies and leading edge care for patients affected by COVID-19. Our overall strategy is to provide a multi-pronged approach that includes rapid precision testing, the latest treatment therapies that are being discovered, and proactively bringing research breakthroughs to the bedside. After seeing what has happened in other cities around the country, I have been frequently asked the question, will we have enough providers and equipment to meet the needs in this pandemic? That's really not an easy question to answer. But as Oklahomans, we all understand the very, that very different possibilities can happen in situations such as severe weather. What we know is, is that the best approach in any of these is to be prepared for any scenario. And while there is no perfect model today to provide precise answers to this COVID pandemic, we at OU Medicine have been using the best information to look at multiple different scenarios and then design different team structures to address them. Our primary goals in each of these scenarios is first, number one, to be well prepared with adequate levels of staffing across those teams. Then secondly, to ensure the safety of our providers with necessary personal protective equipment so that they can provide the highest quality of care, no matter what the scenario. Also, in our ongoing efforts for various manpower needs, we are working with state and local agencies to assess the availability of manpower across multiple care settings in the Oklahoma, central Oklahoma area. Through this readiness, we can then increase the number of providers should we be faced with a surge situation beyond what our system's current personnel can provide. This also ensures additional staffing should any of the members of our healthcare system become ill from COVID itself. Our planning efforts have led to establishing temporary positions for physicians, mid-level providers, intensive care unit nurses, medical surge nurses and respiratory therapists from those in the community who are interested in temporary employment or volunteering. Options include telemedicine initiatives for those providers who may want to work in non-direct patient care settings. Medical professionals across the state who are willing to join us can go to our website, oumedicine.com forward slash COVID to indicate not only their willingness and a skill set, but also the time frame that they are willing to work or to volunteer. Emergency practice privileging for providers has also been implemented so that these professionals can either volunteer for different durations of time or join as temporary compensated providers working 12-hour shifts. 
We are really pleased to say that so far we have already received an outpouring of support from our retired and alumni physicians statewide who want to help in some way with this epidemic. Including this acknowledged support, we now have over 100 providers that are willing to help us meet the COVID challenge should it be needed. And for that, I'd like to say a really big thank you. I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Jason Sanders, Provost of the Health Sciences Center, to talk about protective equipment. Thank you, Dr. Zubialdi, and good morning. <clears throat> As you know, face masks are the first line of defense for healthcare workers who are battling the COVID-19 pandemic. OU Medicine is proud to have already instituted universal masking on our campus, which means every individual is asked to wear a mask. There are varying mask types depending upon the clinical area and situation. And this is critical to protect our patients and to protect our healthcare providers. This also increases our need for different types of masks including surgical mask, KN95 mask, and N95 mask, which you've heard described as personal protective equipment or PPE. The global supply for this equipment continues to be uncertain, and we are actively taking steps to secure more supplies. The availability of these supplies long-term is also uncertain due to the incredible demand worldwide. N95 masks, for example, are the recommended protective mask for healthcare workers. For example, they can be fit tested to each provider to ensure safety. Currently, health systems are asking their employees to utilize standardized sterilization processes to be able to use these N95 masks multiple times. This extends the supplies as we prepare for the surge. We at OU are already using ultraviolet and hydrogen peroxide processes to sterilize masks to extend that supply for our providers. We are grateful to Governor Stitt for focusing on procuring this personal protective equipment, these masks, for the state's COVID-19 response. All health systems need an abundant amount of mask and personal protective equipment because of the supply chain shortfalls worldwide and because this virus, COVID-19, is a respiratory virus which is highly infectious. While OU and others are pursuing discovery of a vaccine and bringing new treatments to Oklahomans, as you just heard yesterday, the first patients in Oklahoma treated with the convalescent serum. There is not yet a vaccine, and we anticipate the need for a masking strategy not only during the surge, but after the surge. To prepare for the anticipated peak of COVID-19 cases in Oklahoma and the ongoing worldwide shortage of masks, OU Medicine is launching the One Million Mask Campaign. The One Million Mask Campaign is our part in the fight against COVID. The ability that we have to apply unique capabilities to test masks and to assist manufacturers in getting their mask evaluated into the right providers The scale of the need requires high volume manufacturers to participate. And we also need help from those of you who are watching from home. Because we are all in this together, we ask all Oklahomans to join this effort to save the lives of patients and to protect our healthcare workers in this unprecedented crisis. As part of the challenge, our One Million Mask Challenge, we have launched a website that includes information for manufacturers, information for donations of various types of mask, surgical mask, KN95 mask, N95 mask, face shields as well. It includes patterns 
for those of you who already and wish to continue creating homemade masks, cloth patterns for patient masks, a pattern for surgical pa masks, and a face shield pattern. That website is oumedicine.com forward slash the challenge. We have team members coordinating in-kind donation drop-offs and working with our health system partners across the city to coordinate these types of in-kind donations. Our supply chain team is able to continue guiding manufacturers on the best ways to help. And there's a special section on our challenge website for manufacturers with contact information for our supply chain team. Several of our partners, as you've heard, have already answered the call to manufacture masks and PPE and to bring several types of masks to our campus and in-kind donations. Mathis Brothers, for instance, has already retooled its mattress factory to produce much needed cloth face mask. Others who have contributed are Century Martial Arts, Delisi, Mevion, the Oklahoma Dental Association, the University of Oklahoma Norman Campus, Marathon Oil, and many others. Alongside hundreds of schools, sewing groups, and community volunteers who have also contributed to the campaign. In addition, the healthcare students across the OU Health Sciences Center are leading and coordinating several aspects of the homemade mask components of this challenge. I am so proud of our students for their innovation and their service. To date, we've already been receiving items toward our one million mask challenge, but we still have a long way to go. As you've heard, we're preparing for the surge and we're preparing for after the surge. We hope that you, everyone listening today, your neighbors, our business partners, will continue to rally in our fight against the coronavirus, COVID-19. For this reason, we want you to help us rally around the One Million Mass Challenge and not only achieve that goal, but go beyond it, again, for the safety of our patients and our providers in this unprecedented challenge. All healthcare workers and patients need these different types of masks. We are in this together with Governor Stitt, the state, the county and city departments of health, the Oklahoma Hospital Association, and our health system partners. We are truly grateful for your generosity and support of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. We'll now take questions from the media community and our Facebook Live audience. Uh, we have several questions. Um, the first question being, what constitutes an intensive care bed? Dr. Sanders? Thank you for the question. An intensive care bed is also called a critical care bed. It's when a patient needs an additional level of support, particularly in this case, with COVID-19 help breathing. It is intensive care with more equipment, uh, personnel who are spending more time with the patient, our providers. And as you've also heard, particularly with COVID-19, it's the setting in which we can provide life-saving care with a ventilator, which is a specialized piece of equipment that literally supports a patient's breathing. As you know, that's part of the challenge and why our surge capacity is so critical in scaling up for over 400 beds here at OU Medicine because patients who have COVID-19 need longer care in the hospital than with other conditions. The other part of the answer is in addition to breathing, the intensive care is needed to provide support for other vital organs, for the heart and the kidneys it is the most advanced technology that our health systems have to support patients in this time. Another question is, at what point will we consider the need to activate the surge plan? Chris, would you be willing to answer that? Thank you, Jennifer. In some ways, the Incident Command Center officially opened in early March, and so some of 
our planning has been going on since then, uh, implementing the emergency operations of the tents outside our emergency department for respiratory symptom patients, working with other hospitals in their incident command centers, planning for the surge together. However, officially, we would go into the expansion capability that we've spoken about today when our licensed critical care beds were exhausted and we would move to the alternative sites that we have talked about today. Another question is where the 100 additional providers are coming from. Are they community providers? Are they within our organization or from out of state? So thanks for the clarification question. Uh, the 100 that I mentioned before are providers from outside of our system. As, a academic, uh, as an academic health system, we're very grateful to our alumni and, and other community uh, colleagues that uh, uh, really are uh, very much willing to become a part of these, this effort. And so uh, that, that clarifying that is that's over and above the number of providers in our system. Those are providers outside of the system. Another question is around what types of range of numbers are we expecting in our modeling for the surge and how is that predictive model developed? I'm going to ask Dr. Sanders to answer that question since we've been engaged with that across the region. Thank you for the question. Uh, as you know, modeling the spread of COVID-19 has been a focus now for weeks and months. We collaborated here at OU with the Governor's Task Force and others across the state to contribute to that modeling for looking at the surge. We we'll direct our listeners to many online websites now uh, that you can see the model uh, and you've seen it both here in Oklahoma and at a federal level. And we're using a variety of data and improving now Oklahomans who are seeking care for COVID prepare for this surge. As you've seen, it's a curve where the rate of infection rises. And we've been trying to bend that curve through our social distancing and stop the spread campaign. And eventually that curve will re reach a peak, a plateau. And then it will start to level off and the infection rate will go down. As you've heard for those patients who are severely affected by COVID, who need that long-term care in the hospital, their stay in the health system, and sadly, those Oklahomans will lose in this fight, will lag by some time the peak of the infection rate. We, along with our partners across the state, are watching this every day. That's why our surge plan has four phases, and we have checkpoints in place as we look at the data compared against actual numbers and projections to activate from phase one to two, two to three, and so forth. We'll continue to work with state partners, and as you know, at the state level, the Governor's Task Force has mapped out across the entire state critical thresholds of capacity, such as total hospital beds, total ICU beds, ventilators, and we're sharing that uh, with the state uh, for our availability here. So we'll have a coordinated Oklahoma response. I would also say that after this surge, which is the focus today, OU will work with our partners to be a leader and how the state responds after the surge. We're so focused now on that peak, and it'll be a milestone in our fight against COVID, but we'll have many, many more milestones after that in the fight as the infections go down to make sure they go as low as possible after that, and to be vigilant to watch in the months ahead for any resurgence of COVID. Another question is, how is the health system allocating resources to prepare for the surge and also specifically the tower? Uh, two components of that. <clears throat> the, uh, obviously, the tower project was started uh, in 2017, so that project is, is funded and was part of our, our capital budget already. Uh, the major source of allocation of resources also is staffing and PPE. And clinical staffing is a focus that Dr. Zubiel, they spent a lot of time uh, reviewing, but acquiring as much PPE to protect our patients and staff is another critical investment we'll be making, certainly also working with the state on how we may have other sources distributed when needed.
how many additional beds have been or will be provided by the accelerated construction of the additional patient towers floor? I think we just had a clarification of wanting to understand that. And then also a clarification around when they will be available. So we'll have uh, up to 144 ICU beds available early June. Uh, we were targeting June 1. Obviously, there's a lot of variables in play with an accelerated project. And then additional 30 beds available for less acute patients, but still medical surgical care. Um, another question is, uh, it's a follow-up, it's how many licensed critical care beds are there now that would need to be exhausted? So kind of speaking to the surge plan and if there's any kind of clear delineation around what each part of the four parts of the surge plan involves. Not necessarily too detailed, but if there's any kind of high lights or milestones in those four phases. Thank you for the question. Uh, OU Medicine has 89 adult intensive critical care licensed beds across our system, and so those are all included in being utilized for patient care in phase one. Uh, as has been mentioned several times, we have four phases of our surge plan. Uh, as care continues in the COVID-19 surge, there are more and more areas that we see decreased volume of care, and so the surge plan takes advantage of those areas that we are having less patients in related to um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So our elective volumes in the surgical areas have gone down and thus um, as we progress in phase one and phase two, we move into some of the perioperative areas, including the operating rooms, the pre-op areas, the ambulatory surgery center. Um, one of our later stages takes advantage um, takes into account the emergency department at the OU Medical Center uh, admin location so that we can maintain that operation as long as possible. Uh, we also look for areas that have large spaces to be able to take care of large groups of patients at one time. So as you progress through the later stages, you find us getting into a, a smaller area like a um, dialysis unit um, or a uh, admissions pending unit. So those locations are all prepared with medical gases and electrical capability to support the equipment needed for the intensive care patients. Um, it has also been determined and planned to maximize our utilization of the additional providers and healthcare team that we've talked about today, as well as uh, maximizing the efficiency of the PPE resources that we have so that we make sure that we are never wasteful with those and maximize uh, that opportunity. We did have a question to further clarify the one million mask challenge, just wanting to hear the website one more time. That is oumedicine.com forward slash the challenge. Uh, 